Hi there and welcome to the summarized version of my presentation about using English in the language classroom. This is directed at Japanese teachers of English. I will also put together a Japanese version of this presentation which can be viewed on my YouTube channel. Let's begin. These are the main points I want to cover in this presentation. Please note that this is a summarized version made for the purposes of this video. I guess the first question we need to consider is why? Why should we use English in the language classroom? Surely it is easier and quicker to use the student's first language or L1. Some people believe that English classes should be taught entirely in English. Obviously, if we are in an ESL environment, and our students are from different backgrounds, this is important. But in an EFL situation, where students share the same L1, I believe there are some advantages, from a motivational perspective, in using students' L1. Well, that is a point of a discussion for another time. Here, I want to look at the advantages of using English in the classroom. The linguistic advantages for native speakers are obvious. Native speakers often are more able to show natural rhythm, pronunciation, and fluency of the language. The language we use is, naturally, more, well, natural. Non-native speakers, regardless of their proficiency in the target language, have a massive advantage in being able to be a role model and motivate their students, both as learners and users of the target language. It is for this reason that I also encourage native speakers of English, such as ALTs living in Japan, to be prepared to study and use Japanese at times with students. This can create a mutual respect between students and teachers. The key word for this presentation is authenticity. Try to use English that is as close to real English as possible. When I teach, I always try to start on time. I realize that this is not always possible, but if you can get to class a little before the bell, you use the full 45 or 50 minutes of your lesson. Rather than using the phrases in the top left corner of this slide, try the ones below. Using sets such as 30 seconds, get your books, are you ready? And let's begin will help you and your students start the lesson as the bell rings. Once the class starts, one of the classic questions asked by teachers is about the weather, as we can see in the top left corner. But would we really say this? I mean, if we just look out the window, we can see. Instead, we can ask students, who we can call the weather reporters, to prepare information about the weather in another city or country. Our language becomes a little more authentic this way. We can start the lesson with a short conversation like this. Weather reporters, please. How's the weather in Delhi? It's sunny. How's the weather in Delhi, everyone? It's sunny. Get students involved in the class as early as possible to get the energy of the lesson on the way up. We can do something similar to the date as we did with the weather. Rather than just asking what the date is, we can ask students to prepare information about some event that is happening on the day. I've given an example of reporting on a birthday. Of course, you can do anything you like in your class. Notice that there are a lot of S sounds at the end of these words. Make sure you are strong with these words. Japanese language follows a consonant-vowel rhythm, whereas English uses a consonant-vowel-consonant rhythm. Therefore, some Japanese may say, for example, PRIZU rather than PLEASE. 
Next, I want to move on to praising students. Praising students is obviously important. However, it is much deeper and more difficult than many people think. If we just praise students by saying very good all the time, like on the left, it can have negative effects on students being praised and those not being praised, as researchers of the self-worth theory report. We also need to think, is everything our students say really that good? Let's have a look at how the different parts of the conversation on the left could be changed to be more effective praise. One of the main points of Carol Dweck's research is praising effort rather than ability. Rather than just saying, very good, when students give the right answer, we could praise them on the way that they give their answer. We also need to think about what we would say if students don't get the right answer, even if they made the effort to participate. I'm sure you're aware now that the conversation on the left is not ideal. We can thank the students for participating. Also, another way of praising is by making a comment related to the content of what the students said. If we just say, very good, after a student has told us correctly that it was sunny, the student doesn't know whether what he or she has said was really understood. However, if the teacher can add a short comment like, yes, it's a beautiful day, the student may feel, hey, my teacher understood what I said in English. And this can be very effective in motivating students. I mentioned briefly before that we should think about what to say if students get the wrong answer. Of course, the wrong answer is not necessarily a bad thing. The wrong answer is better than no answer at all. There are many ways of responding to students' mistakes and errors. I am a believer of encouraging students to correct their own mistakes. Here is an example of one way a teacher may respond to a student getting the wrong answer to a question. Finally, at the end of the class, we want to finish strongly and just like the start of the class, on time. Giving a few tips for how to prepare for the next lesson might be helpful for students too. I've taught in many different situations in Japan and sometimes find super teacher. These are teachers who obviously love English and have studied it very hard. This is fantastic and I really respect their hard work or anyone's hard work to learn to speak a second language fluently. However, sometimes it is possible to go over the top and use what I call machine gun English. In his brilliant book, David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits and the Art of Battling Giants, author Malcolm Gladwell refers to studies on the inverted U scale. He gives the example of drinking wine and that drinking a healthy amount of wine, for example two glasses a night for the average male, is ideal. If you drink more than that, it will be bad for your health. I think the same can be said for motivating students. By aiming for a level just above what students expect, we can achieve the ideal level of motivation. Anything more may have negative effects. The trick, though, is getting to know your students and to find out their expectations so you can work slightly above those levels. Well, that's about it. These are the main points I covered in this summary. These are the references cited in this presentation. Carol Dweck's fantastic book Mindset has been translated into Japanese for those who are interested. 
Finally, thanks again for taking the time to watch this presentation. If you have any comments, please feel free to add them below.